Oh, man. What a day, man. What a day. You know? I, I can't believe. I can't believe what just happened. Just what a day. I can't believe what just happened. It's true. What an interview, man. It was an amazing interview we had. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, he did not bring up your shirt, which I find kind of... What, is it loud? Uh, a little bit loud? It's a little loud. I mean, yeah. yeah. I was going for like a Benicio Del Toro in uh, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas kind of look, you know, mixed with like a Miami Vice kind of, but in Minnesota. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You think I hit it on the hit the nail on the head? Uh, I mean, you're close. You're really close. Yeah? Yeah. You like it? You like my shirt. It's Come on. flashy. It is. It's flashy. <laughs> well, okay. You know. That's that's right. You're you're again wearing a uh, monotone V-neck T-shirt, so you can't talk. Uh, yeah, man. I only wear monotone V-neck T-shirts. <sighs> yeah. Honestly, you look <laughs> you look like you sell tickets to the unicycle store. If there was a unicycle store, I'd be all about it. Yeah, and then all the unicycles would be one color. Uh, hopefully, this awesome <laughs> burgundy wine. <laughs> How dare you? This shirt is amazing. <laughs> How dare you? Oh, man. No, that, that interview is amazing. It went good. So today we're going to be talking to Jack Rebel. Okay? One of the biggest chefs in Minnesota. You could argue Legendary. the biggest. You could argue the biggest chef. I mean, his history in the state is unrivaled and he's going he's going through some health problems right now so he's not uh incredibly present but in that interview i mean dude he was sharp i've i i learned a lot i think everybody else is gonna learn a lot he was Mm -hmm. still funny um yeah it was it was much needed i think it's much needed for the community i totally agree with you i um i feel like he really really hit some points with us yeah um that worked uh, really well yeah it did it did we talked about he, actually we didn't talk about everything i wanted to talk about no because he got down to the nitty-gritty on everything that we asked him i mean he was very detail oriented and it we we did this wide spectrum of all these different subjects that we were talking about it was just so cool man so cool i'm so excited i'm excited for everybody at home to be listening to it uh to be watching it to get to see into his mind and Mm -hmm. what you know he talked we talk about things that are present you know with the covid crisis we talk about history we talk about minnesota america the world cooking i i just think it's all around a good episode um, let's give let's give a little bit of background because he gets into his background, but I think we should give a little bit of background to people who are like, I'm not entirely sure. I've heard about Jack Rebel, but I'm not sure everything that he's done. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, you have some stuff on him, right? I do. I okay. Do. Um, I mean, like he says, um, he did start at Goodfellows, um, which I mean, being a sous chef for that long, uh, a decade is is unheard of these days yeah he wasn't um, he was a sous chef for a decade i don't think i've made it more than 18 months as a sous chef to be honest no with you. and i mean to stay at one place is insane yeah it's insane and to think about it though i mean for us to say that now is one thing but back then that's what you had to do to rise yeah like you had to stay at the same fucking place yeah and bust ass to even do anything yeah and that's just a proven thing that we saw today with jack like it was i mean the rise of success is it's oh i mean you can just hear it in his voice he's just incredibly confident he knows he he's he's to the point and at the same time knows every single point that he's talking about Mm -hmm. and that clearly comes with experience so he he started at goodfellas and then um, went from Goodfellows to, to La Belle Vie. La Belle Vie. Yep. And uh, that was his first executive chef position. So he went from La Belle Vie to the Dakota. Yes. And after the Dakota, he went to Butcher and the Boar. 
Yep. yep. And he owned Butcher and the Boar, right? Yes. He that, So that was his first, like, venture that he actually owned part of it. Yep. And then um, and then I think when Rooney died, um, the, it, he started to look at other, uh, uh, other ventures and eventually uh, teamed up with Toma, end of the show, and then uh, started the Lexington. Mm -hmm. I, I think he did some other ventures with um, Toma and Fitzgerald um, in between that, um, starting um, Foro and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I forgot about El Foro. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but with that same group, he opened up the Lexington. Yeah, okay. And they did, they did like, Smack Shack as well. Yeah, Smack and Shack. And, um, I think those are the most well-known ones yeah. that he's been a part of and and that's what people will recognize mm -hmm. um and then he's done countless consulting gigs with restaurants in, in the twin cities oh, for yeah. the past 35 35 years mm -hmm. uh he was born in, in saint paul in minnesota he went to high school at central i mean he's a saint paul boy yeah i, I mean, mean through and through it's uh if you want to, if you want to see Minnesota well done, Jack Rebel is in, is I mean, that I, would be the picture right next to it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. All right, man. Um, it was a it was an interview that went a little bit longer than we even expected it. Um, yeah. It and so I think we should just get right into it with him. I agree. I agree. All I mean, right, guys. Uh, here's Jack Rebel. This is the Inquisition, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Kidding. Yep, pretty much. We're going we're gonna to grill you. Dude, you're growing your hair out, man. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. Actually, I cut it all off. Oh, I can't. Oh, from the back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Nice. So I used to have the whole thing, and, and now uh, now I, got it, I get it cut by a guy on West 7th, and it's, I mean, dude, it looks so great. I'm so happy. Where do you go? The barber look. mug? Uh, no, I actually go to Saints Coast bar, uh, Barber Shop. It's like a, okay. you know, they're like new school dudes but awesome. old school cuts, you know? Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Well, um, All right. anything you don't want to talk about? No, dude. Cool. Yeah. All right. I'm pretty well. transparent, dude. We know. <laughs> yeah. We'll just get right into it then, man. Yeah. I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't made my living and worrying about what people think about what I say. You know? <laughs> it's true. Anyway. Yeah, let's go. All right. Sweet. Yeah, Seth, Seth, why don't you, uh, you have some good questions for him. Why don't you start off? Yeah, so uh, you went to school uh, at Central, correct? Yep, yep. Um, I, and then did you drop out or what was that? Yeah, I was a high school dropout. I did one year of school at Central. Prior to that, I went to St. Paul Open School. Okay. So like a ACL kind of program or something. Uh, correct. And actually yep. was, yep. I, uh, I enrolled even further. I went on an on, on the job training, which meant that I did, uh, four hours of required classroom in the morning. And then I would work from 11 to seven every day. <laughs> did you do, um, were you cooking? No, it was my first job. Actually, I was a, I was what they call the swamper. I cleaned a bakery at rainbow on Snelling and Midway. Oh yeah. 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 It's a, yeah. So that I went in there and that's what I did every day. Clean caramel pans, floors, mixers, everything. But there was a cooking component in the same workspace. And so I just mm -hmm. became curious about it. And uh, more and more, then they began to give me prep jobs. I mean, you know, the story of every dishwasher becomes a prep cook, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So that's how it started. Nice. And then you went, you went to college, uh, St. Saint Paul, Saint Paul College, right? Yeah, well, it wasn't a college when I went. It was a vocational school. And thankfully, you didn't have to have a great equivalency because at that point, I didn't have my GED. So I passed the entrance exam and I roll, enrolled in 80, 86, I guess. 85 maybe um i did a year there i didn't finish um because i took a job i'll throw manford krug under the bus manford krug got me an awesome job opening the radisson hotel in downtown minneapolis um so i was on an amazing team of people doing like a world-class hotel at that time it was the flagship for kirk carlson okay um and so i pretty much started working 80 hours a week instead of going to school because i was opening a hotel you know um and it was amazing so then that that led to the rest. I mean, two years later, I was two and a half, I guess I was uh, applying for a job in the line at Goodfellows. I was 21 and I became a sous chef the first year after I worked there. So 2000 and, or not 2000, sorry, 1989 or 90, I guess. I was a sous chef already at 22. 
and that was for like a decade, right? For, yeah, I stayed there for 11 years. Um, I yeah, became executive crazy. sous. We, well, I probably would have left after like five years, but we moved the restaurant to the location on 7th in the old Forum Cafeteria. And right. it was almost like reopening a new restaurant, you know, and I'd taken on a role pretty much. At that time, there wasn't as much chef to cuisine jobs in restaurants. It was more you were the executive sous and you kind of ran everything for the chef. And that was pretty much my role then for the next I guess five years or six years before I took my first technical chef job, which was at La Belle V in 2000. I ran La Belle V in Stillwater when Tim and Josh opened Solera. Yeah. Okay. And so that was my first technical job, a, a title, technical title of executive chef. Wrote all my own menus, did everything. Um, to continue, that I left there uh, after about two and a half years when they decided to move downtown. Yeah. To the location in 510. And I got a call from a recruiter for a job for a large fine dining restaurant in downtown. It turned out to be the Dakota Jazz Club, which I was a member, which is kind of ironic. Um, and I ended up as a chef there for almost five and a half years um, mm -hmm. before I did my first project with Tim Rooney um, and did Butcher and the Boar. Nice. So I did Butcher and the Boar for three years. 2013, I was nominated and I left Butcher and the Boar. I partnered with uh, Josh Toma and Kevin Fitzgerald, who own Smack Shack, the principal of Smack Shack. And we started a couple different endeavors. We did uh, Ill, Ill Fated El Foro. Uh, we did the Patty Shack, which was like a burger, Irish burger, fish and chip joint, and the halftime rec bar. And then we did um, the Lexington. I mean, it, the guys was always the Lexington. We purchased it in April of 2014. We didn't open until 2017. Right. By the time we raised adequate funding and could complete all the construction, I mean, it took literally three years huh. wow um wow and then you know i mean i actually chris still worked with me at that point i'm probably shortly after we opened probably after the first year huh oh yeah no it was after the first year uh i got started with you uh i think it was a kind of a mixture of seth and uh mike you and one of your sues who kind of introduced yeah. me to you and it it, we kind of hit the ground running. You were already totally opera operational and you were doing a lot of things there. Um, but I didn't really, I wasn't really aware fully of like the, the intensity of that place. I mean, you were doing so much. We talked about it a little bit in our last episode. Like you were, you had the, the ground floor, you had the rooftop patio and then you had event centers and then you were doing out, you know, um, you were doing out offsite catering at the Lexington was, was a total beast. It total is a beast. Uh, it's a, <laughs> it was a beast for me, dude. And I'd been doing it for, you know, 35 years before that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah. um, it's almost a hotel job in that respect. Like you're talking about, you know, by the time you have to try to coordinate all those different revenue centers, dude, it's a busy job. Yeah. It did I mean, remind me a lot of the St. Paul grill or like the St. Paul hotel kind of scenario, you know, yeah. like just pushing stuff out, uh, and such great capacity, you know. So. It's a big restaurant too, you guys. I mean, and Christo, you can attest to that. I mean, there's, there's nights, guys, when you just, you know, you get pounded. There's just no way around it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It was, <laughs> and do, it, do 600 covers on a Saturday night from 4 o'clock to 11. You know what I mean? That's like yeah. 100 people an hour, yeah. dude, you know? Absolutely. You get rocked. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it definitely rocked. And one thing I was super impressed by was how consistent the food stayed, even though we were doing numbers like that. Like even, especially on, on days like, uh, like on New Year's or on Mother's Day, it's like, you, you know, you're double or tripling those numbers and everything is still, you're still at the, on the line, making sure that everything Running goes that out. Pass. Absolutely. Like yeah. absolutely consistent. It was a challenging job in that respect. It's interesting that you say that, Christos, because it was the first time that I'd worked with, uh, you know, like a galley style kitchen, right? Where the cooking takes place in three different stations and kind of all comes forward to the line yeah um and you realize you know that it's great that fine dining restaurants around the world adapt that because you know your sous chefs and your chef can be on the line watching everything on the other hand yep. though it's challenging if you've never done it particularly in a restaurant of that size you know so i found myself yeah. having to do that you know not only for quality control but just you know that process required a lot of leadership you know yeah, yeah a lot of hands -on. i agree i it was very hands-on Seth. you're right yeah it was, and it, it wasn't was, cookie cutter. I mean, as simple as we, it was, it was elevated simplicity, you know, and sometimes the execution was flawed because it was a little bit too uh, maybe fussy, if you want to call it that. But, you know, I mean, I think the idea was always well-grounded, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it was well grounded and it was like heavily technique based. Whereas like when, you know, like I went off and, and cooked at Broder's for a while and it was all very like freestyle, very creative, very seasonal. Things were constantly changing. We're doing a daily this and a daily that. And at the Lex at, at, at uh, the Lexington, it, the only things that really changed were like our, our seasonal seafood market fish. And, and that was, that was really it. So everything was so screwed in it was so it was so tight and it Kept had to be done very supper way. club well thanks very yeah that club. was the idea and you know i got that experience at the dakota because really when you begin to do that kind of volume if you can't if you can't have control measures you know we'll call them that you know everything gets focused on technique like you said and then the control measures are don't change things often and be redundant right like you got to continue to teach people how to do the basic things that you do well before you can actually evolve um i think we've evolved a little now but you know we all suffer i think too from turnover i mean it was a hard job it was a lot i'm, I'm demanding guy to work for i'm not afraid to say it um but i think you know on the crew that you were on dude we were doing some amazing stuff and had that crew stayed together for more than that year it probably would have even been remarkable you know i mean i totally think it's a testament that. to to like you got to have consistent leadership and you got to do well. And we had a lot of young people that hadn't been cooking at that level before, you know, and I think, I, and I'm not to brag, I, there's a reason people don't cook like that anymore, you know, but I, it's how, what I learned, it's what I know, it's what I do. You know what I mean? It's you know, not, I, I find it interesting that you, br that you brought up the youth because I, I think less about they were young in cooking and more about they were young in leadership. So yeah, like in life, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, yeah. Because you had all this experience and leadership, but then you go, you go down to the CDC level and the sous chef level and the guys who are like, you know, supposed to bring the team together. And this is like they're either their first or second job. And I think that's where things started to kind of like, they started to kind of come together at the seams. You know, yeah. I, I think that's why the, the, the team didn't stick together. That, that's all I'm yeah. saying. That's and it's hard, you know, it's, I, it, I always, I often question, you know, what makes great leaders. And I think you can train to be a good manager. You can do things with consistency and you can do things with certain levels of training. But I, I mean, I do think leadership to a degree um, is just inherent. Some people are just better at doing it. They have the desire to do it. I'd say, um, yep. I think for a lot of people, sometimes they handicap themselves in respect to the fear of decision making which i think you know comes from immaturity as well like when you mentioned not only are they young and cooking but as young individuals you know you haven't made tough decisions in your life yet you haven't done other things yet you know probably the toughest decision you made was coming to work in the kitchen you know right <laughs> putting up life with experiences day, you know? yeah and and i think we all mature i know i have you learn a lot and you move forward and that's part of the reason i guess back to buttoning it down is i think when you want to be consistent you're doing that volume you have to be redundant right Otherwise, people don't learn how to do things properly, you know. And once you get your technique down, and you know this, Krista, once you, once you establish a handful of techniques, we've always called them crutches in my generation, you know, the things that you always fall back yeah. on, you know. Yeah. They're important, though. It's important to have those, right? That becomes your foundation for everything you cook moving forward. You know, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have your, your basic moves. You know, for you, I think it's really cool because you come from a very uh, food cultural background with your family and, and you know and your ethnicity and and those things are gonna for lack of better terms immigrate their way into those styles that you'll adapt because they're what you know you're familiar with they're your memories i mean those are important things i think in food you know yeah well i always thought that it was cool to just to use a technique that i learned in a different culture of food because not just like my family being being greek but it's just like i've worked in so many different environments that have used so many different techniques so it's like you're using a more, uh, you know, Italian technique, but you're using it at the Lexington and it works, you know, far better than what the classical French teaching would be. That's, that's my, that's my love of the variety is like actually oh, yeah. not necessarily like, you know how they do like, uh, they do like Asian fusion with things. That's not sure. really what I'm more interested in about. I'm like, I, I'm interested in about like using how you used serrano pesto right it's just a very subtle it's a very subtle mix of of two different cultures you know what i mean I, absolutely i do and i you yeah, know i think I totally seth can attest that in bartending yeah. too you know it's the mm -hmm. same thing is you become rooted in some classic moves which yeah. can then become interpreted with different ingredients i think the you know the point that you make Chris, that's important is 
you know, it shows you um, the necessity of being technique driven, you know, because when you have technique, then you can just emulate ingredients and without getting political. That's the genius of food, right? I mean, you watch immigrant culture around the world. It's yep. transcended things. And one, one simple example, and, and I'll rip off David Chang because he mentioned it for the general public, you know, is like El Pastor, the famous taco of central Mexico. Yeah. It's Lebanese, thinking. dude. And, yeah. People, yeah. and people don't understand that, right? Pizza actually isn't, you know, yeah, there's a Neapolitan pizza, but a pizza was really perfected and used as a lunch food in the lower east side of Manhattan during a mass Italian immigration, you know, and, and likely it was prepared even by Italian Jew. I mean, I don't know that, but I'm just saying it's interesting because people don't consider that you know, you bring your technique somewhere, but you don't necessarily have the ingredients. So you adapt the ingredients to yep. the technique and you create something that's uniquely a result of cultures colliding, you know? Well, and that's, that's an interesting thing from the Greek perspective, because really all gyros is, is pastor with lamb. So like classic, classic gyros, not like, you, you know, what you get today where it's, it's, it's very processed is basically pastor done in the same way with very similar seasonings, but instead of with pork, it's done with lamb. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's like, yeah, no. I, I love that. I love those little, uh, those little Easter eggs. I, I live for those Easter eggs, honestly. <laughs> yes, you should. You know, when I was doing the Patty Shack, I, let a, I did a lot of reading on uh, Irish culture, and there was a really good cookbook with uh, great stories in it by Andrew Coleman, who was a writer for the New York Times. He, like, went and lived in in Ireland, you know, over the course of seven or 10 years periodically and really studied the culture. But it was interesting that, you know, we think of corned beef and cabbage and really it was a technique brought to New York and they, you know, they used brisket. It became corned beef because they, you know, that's what they had available to them. They used that. And it, so, you know, when you go to Ireland necessarily, you don't really find a corned beef brisket. You just find a cooked beef brisket. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just, yeah. I just find stuff, find stuff like that fascinating, you know, because I think it really, it shows the importance of cooking technique. And if, you know, without going too deep into it, a classic example in my mind is like, you know, the charred fruits and salsas of Thailand and Vietnam are very similar to the charred fruits and salsas of Mexico and Central America. They're just right. different ingredients, right? Yeah. And then you get that, I guess you called it fusion. I guess we, you know, that's the easiest way to describe it, but that's where that happens. And I, I think it's amazing. You know, I like to watch the transitional culture of food through migration. I think it's been really it's fascinating anyway for me. I, you know, I'm actually thinking about having somebody on the show who has like a degree in food history and we're just okay. going to, we're going to break down a lot of these, like a lot of the pathways of some of the different dishes that, that we see today. Cause I cool. mean, I, I, it's, it's a huge giant web. It's kind of similar to language where it's like, you know, our, in the English language is mostly Latin, but uh, Latin and Greek but really we use mostly German words. So there's like this weird web of where English actually comes from. I think the same goes for food. Totally. Very cool. That's cool. You say, you know, I think about cocktails in reference to that, you know, a lot of people don't realize like when the French blockaded the, the Gulf of Mexico during the civil war, you know, brandy and cognac wasn't available to new Orleans. So they yeah. started using bootleg whiskey. And when yeah. it was much cheaper and affordable, you know, you look then into the, into the you know, late, 19th century post civil war and all the cocktails coming out of new orleans went from cognac to bourbon you know yep or uh, or yep. you know uh, of some rem some 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 remnants uh, some semblance excuse me of of whiskey you know and it became distinctly american you because know? most of the the classic cocktails were actually cognac that came out of new orleans yeah. that people don't and, and sometimes gin because gin was imported right yep yep so yeah. I, yeah, again, like, I think you can follow that culture and it, I think it's just absolutely amazing. I find, co I find cocktails fascinating in that way. Cause again, like in a lot of cooking, there's, you know, there's the classic Daisy, there's the classic cobbler, like there's these techniques that you can really transpose with any ingredients and mix them. And I, I truly believe if you're a good cook, and this is probably testament to you too, Seth, is that you can easily become a bartender. I feel like the skill yeah, the skill well, is that's, absolutely the same, right? It's a recipe, yeah. a formula, a technique, and, and the rest. That's why it was so well. easy to change um, for yeah. me. Um, and you can handle the stress, right? Yeah, because the back allows, you know. Yeah. So, and worked. I think it's an easy transition. I really do. I think anybody who's a good cook who understands, you know, what we're talking about in this conversation can easily then translate that to cocktail mm -hmm. knowledge, you know. Yeah. And it, thinking it, it of it as ingredient space. It helps knowing flavors and that kind of yeah. thing I feel. And I, I and learned of course, that from that. 
now we're also given the opportunity of all the modern science, right? Like I'm still learning the science of food, which today is probably on greater display than it's ever been, right? I mean, it, you can still teach an old dog new tricks, you know? So I, I picked up the uh, Noma Guide to Fermentation, and I've been playing around with, with that. And it's just, like, in terms of like the science, I think that the people like Red Zeppi have really like completely opened a new, like just opened a whole new world. I mean, fermentation has been around for years and years and years, but he has brought scientific techniques to the forefront and yeah. uses them to do, uh, you know, it's like, just his chapter on lacto fermentation you can make with a speed rack, a heater, and a and an air conditioning unit. It's insane. yeah, you don't need much, right? Yeah, it's insane. Now, Dude, I, my wife, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I have a question about Minnesota food culture. Kind of in this, in this, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like what what do you think it is? Because a lot of people, you know, they go geography. Like Eric Harsey, right? He was like, okay, we're basically the same same. Uh, same longitude or, or latitude as Sweden. I'm going to make Swedish food and that's, you know, that's what I'm going to do and it's going to fit with the culture. And uh, I think that that is not, I think that was part of the problem is there's not a lot of want for that. Uh, you have a lot of uh, Hmong population, Mexican population, uh, African American population. You have French Canadians coming down and you have all these different, what have you seen? Cause you've been here, you've been doing the, doing My whole the damn life. thing for, for, for years and years and years, what do you think that like really is starting to form as the mold for a Minnesota food culture? Well, there's a couple of things I think I'd mentioned. I mean, obviously I grew up here and my family was like, I'm divided right down the middle. I'm half German and half Norwegian. And most of our holiday celebrations traditionally were kind of classic Scandinavian food dishes that had come up. You know, my, my grandmother and my family, so my parents and their siblings, all grew up on farms. So we're the first generation of kids that weren't on the farm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we would still go to the farms in the summertime and, you know, and, and work not to the degree that, you know, actual farm kids work today or whatever, but we'd, you know, weed gardens, pick food, feed the hogs, like just, you know, manual labor, you know? Um, but my grandmother was really into food canning, all those things. It was very cool. Um, but culturally pretty traditional in terms of what we think of as like Germanic sausage making, right? Summer sausage and, and a dried beef and chip beef and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I think that that's kind of died off and I think it's true of everything. I mean, I'd ask you, you know, once, once you lose a tradition, like once my grandparents passed, there was no more lutefisk on Christmas, you know, which right. I was actually beginning to enjoy, but uh, my cousin, bless his heart, he still makes awesome lefsa in the tradition and my other cousin makes the rosettes. And so people are still hanging on to that tradition, but it's, I, you know, I don't know what's now, and interesting when you say, what is the food culture? When I first was opening Butcher and the Boar, we had a PR guy that we worked with who was from Cincinnati and had lived in several cities. And he goes, you know, if you could tell me what Minnesota's number one food is, we'd make millions of dollars. Like, what are we known for? Because, you know, Cincinnati's got, you know, the Skyline Chili Dog and they got, you know, the Chili Mac and, and yeah. these things. The chili spaghetti. Spaghetti. Like every, every state has something, right? Philadelphia is the cheesesteak, Wisconsin brought. And we thought to ourselves, what the hell is Minnesota? Now, fast forward, what is that, 10 years ago, I think the only thing I can identify with, like, at least in the urban sector, what's traditionally now considered very Minnesota is the Juicy Lucy. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Which I, I don't even know that it's ours, necessarily, but I feel like we've adopted it from, from all the food guys like Andrew Zimmer, and I'll even mention, you know, Gavin Kissy, they all think of the Juicy Lucy as distinctly Minnesotan, right? Right. Yep. But after that, I really don't, don't know. I think it's a really good question, um, Christo, and I, I think paying homage to all of those different cultures that have created great food for us here. I thought recently I went to LA for the first time as an adult, like I hadn't been in 20 some years. I loved it by the way. Um, but my cousins out there like, dude, you got to get some Vietnamese, man. It's so good. And I'm like, I don't know if it's better than what we have, you know? Right. And so we went, mm -hmm. but the reality was it wasn't like, they were so cool on it. And dude, I think what we have here is so much, well, not necessarily better, but different. You know what I mean? And I think here, here it's still very rooted in like this agrarian culture where it's like, more of the food they eat around the kitchen and the family and like and i i appreciate that because i think it's very authentic you know it hasn't really it hasn't really grafted on to other things yet you know it's still very traditional which i i'm kind of a traditionalist in that respect like i want to see what it really is before i make a determination that it could be something else right see the cool the cool change in culture that i've seen is i grew up so i you grew up kind of like in the selby area right like the selby yep. like right around central high school so i grew up on the east side of saint paul right? And 
the the Hmong population over on the east side of St. Paul it, it exploded when I was a when I was a young kid for for various reasons. And uh, it, you know, you see over on the east side, there's a lot of billboards in Hmong. The the cops are 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 Hmong. The you know the city council is Hmong. So like the culture over on the east side has completely like uh, turned over to the new guard, as you could say. Yeah. And, cool. and, and that's really where I start to see a lot of, uh, a lot of changes to our food culture coming in from the Hmong side. Like you have, Ye, uh, I'll, I'll mention Yia Vang, right? Mm-hmm. He's yeah. Do, he's doing, doing amazing some, stuff, right? Yeah. Amazing. And stuff, stuff that you've never seen before, but very, you know, like purple rice and, and all, all kinds of these family style, just beautiful. Yeah. And, and so it's like, that's, that's the one, the, the one thing that I see starting to change in Minnesota, where we're actually starting to kind of take these minority, not take the minority groups, the minority groups are starting to rise up and do elevated food. And it's starting to kind of like level off the culture and, and kind of, then we can form it with the, with the Norwegian, we can form it with the Germanic, and it, we can start to kind of uh, uh, get a new identity, I think. Hey, dude, it's the American dream, right? I mean, that's it. You know, it all comes together that way. And I don't, I don't think, I think it's fair to assume, you know, that it, it is, it is evolving. I think the interesting thing for me is when you go to the coast, obviously I use New York and California um, as the reference is that there's a much more affluent Asian culture there. So you find more like these high end Korean steakhouses and fancy, you know, Michelin star Chinese. And that hasn't happened here yet. You know what I mean? Because I feel like is, is, even though I think the early eighties was probably the, the largest influx of the immigration of the Hmong people. Um, you know, there hasn't been enough of that affluence in their community yet that we've gotten to that level where we're really going to see elevated dining. I mean, I think lat 14 is the closest thing we've seen in my lifetime. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the King and I did it, but it was Thai, not Vietnamese. Um, but it was interesting to me because I think it is happening to the point of you saying, you know, the new guard is coming in. You're going to watch this develop as, as those generations become more affluent, they become more involved in the community. They can actually make an indelible mark. You know what I mean? And the narrative, I think, in our country right now, and particularly around food and chefs right now, is totally in support of, of Yi Vang. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the story is who are the immigrants that are coming here? Because the reality is, you know, we don't even consider Italian American food, immigrant food anymore. Right. I mean, like right. you're working at Broder's I'm, I'm just using that as a loose example, you know, red sauce, Italian place that you grew up with on the East side, you Russo's or whatever it is, you know, a lot of people don't even consider that, you know, like an ethnic food anymore. Right. We right. we've all had, we had spaghetti and meatballs for, for, you know, five generations now you know what i mean like right. so people just oh yeah you know red sauce joint you know but don't mm-hmm. think about how it actually got here right just like yeah. you're talking about you know it took it took several generations for it to take hold you know and now it's elevated to dude i mean mark vetri and you know mario but you know mario Batali, you can't really say his name anymore, but you got to credit him to some degree lydia bastianich you know she helped form all that and it's dude it's fascinating right mm-hmm. like you're watching it happen right in front of us and yeah. i think it's amazing i want to i'd like to see more and more Somali restaurants, which when you talk about Italian, is so fascinating because they were Italian I would too. So they eat spaghetti and, and chicken cutlet, dude, you know, chicken. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I'm just kind of like, it's kind of funny to think about that. You know what I mean? Like, it's not what you'd expect because I think our first introduction was Ethiopian food. And we all kind of, as squarehead Minnesotans, myself, you know, white guy, thought of that as this is this, <laughs> you know, this is this Western African food. And it's actually super diverse, right? Like it yeah. should be. Mm-hmm. It's just not what, it's just not what I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's amazing. I think it's great food. Dude. I mean, I, I can eat a, a, a kit full any day. I love the, I love the, uh, you know, like the take on Parmigiana Somali style. I think all this stuff's fascinating and I, and I enjoy watching it again, you know, migrate its way into the American culture. We're lucky you guys. I mean, what is American food, right? I mean, well, it's a, well, it's a, it, it's an eclectic mix for sure. You know, it's a mix of all these different cultures. I, I think my curiosity and like, maybe this is a pipe dream, but like, but, when I think of American, like an actual American style food, I think of New Orleans, right? So they had all the, they had these French, French Canadian roots, French roots. Uh, you had uh, South American roots, uh, Haitian roots, and and then the the deep South culture of barbecue, and they all kind of formed and melded into this, you know, uh, very distinct type of food, right? So whereas um, America is not just, it's not just. Uh, 
a, a mix. It's a melting pot and something comes out of that melting pot. And I, yeah, I guess that's what I wanted. Like as a kid, I always wanted us to have a New Orleans, but our oh, yeah. own culture. You know what I mean? In terms of food, yeah. because we have, I mean, my first, my first job was at a taqueria on arcade. And, you know, I worked there for years and years and years. Los Ocampos. Hopefully we'll have him on the show soon. And, I, and it's like, just, this is, this is next door. Why can't this all be one? Do you think that that is uh, like, that's just the times? Like you can go <laughs> anywhere and eat anywhere. So there really is, there's never going to be like a New Orleans coming together like that again. Well, I, you know, I think you're, it's a reference to two things. For, the first to me is the cultural component, right? Yeah. Um, and, and for me, I'm a huge jazz fan. I, a lot of people may not know that, but jazz is like my jam. And I think, you know, culturally, the birthplace in America happened in New Orleans. So there's a very distinct culture to New Orleans, to your point, that I don't think exists anywhere. It's actually my favorite American city because it's so un-American, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and all of the diversity that's there is fantastic. I, the other part of it, like the food part, I reference more than New Orleans, which I think is a, a similar um, kind of immigration period to the new world is I look at the Southwestern food because the first chef I worked for when I opened Goodfellas was from Texas. And so okay. I learned a lot of these guys at that time. It was Jimmy Schmidt, Robert Del Grande, Stephen Piles, uh, uh, Dean Ferry. And these guys were all like new American cooking Southwestern food. Now I don't mean Chili's. I think Chili's is the, is the fast casual spinoff of what I'm talking about, but you know, it was rooted in like, almost traditional Mexican meets Native American mashup, right? Yeah. And it was very elevated, the cuisine. I mean, the sauce making stuff we did was very ele- elevated. You know, it was these guys that were classically French trained, to your point, right? Taking these ingredients of New Mexico and Arizona and Texas and creating in Mexico and creating like a mashup, you know, like using wheat lacoche in place of truffles and you're know, adding truffles to it or, you know, or doing a lobster tamale or do you know what I mean? Like things that really made it, and I found that food amazing, to your point, like to watch that development of what I think are very traditional American flavors, ancho chili. And you probably saw some of that in my cooking, too, when you worked at Deluxe. But that, yeah. that is kind of my foundation. That's what I learned to cook. That's the Serrano pesto reference, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I yeah. love that green chili flavor. And, and I think it's, it's also, as New Orleans is very Creole and Cajun for their migration, so is, to me, the native Southwest, you know, the Navajo and, and, uh, and obviously I think there's even some Mayan influence and Aztec influence in there from central and, 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 uh, in kind of early central America. And I just think that that kind of cuisine to me is really fascinating. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, these are original, these are original American ideas, right? I mean, gumbo is about as American as it gets, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I yeah. mean, it gets, its, it gets its native language from, from okra, right? Gumbo is, is African for okra, or at least Eastern African, the way I understand it. But, you know, again, now they bring the technique over here and the okra over here, but they create something that, you know, with the influence of the roux from the Cajuns becomes instantly a, a mashup, right? And now yeah. we all think of it as, you know, because the Creole don't necessarily use the roux, they just use the okra or the filet. Um, but again, just fascinating, right? I mean, and that was here, you know, you guys, you think about New Orleans, you know, there was people settled there, you know, in the mid, mid 16th century. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we're talking a hundred years before, you know, before Plymouth Rock, you know, before right. yeah. we, we went into Massachusetts. So I, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, there's all of these things that are uniquely American and, and I'm, you know, and I, and I'm a huge component of it. Like, I mean, I think we should promote great things like American bourbon and sweet corn and, and, and nightshades and potatoes, and like these things that are all very new world. Right. I mean, there was mm-hmm. no tomato in Italy you know, before the Spanish brought it back there, right? I mean, yeah. so think about that. Yet we, we immediately associate red sauce with Italian cooking, right? When technically bolognese wow. doesn't even always have tomato, as I know it, you know, there might yeah. be that's right. best, It's more sure. of a ragu as we know it it's in a meat French sauce. cooking, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, a it's a meat sauce, sauce. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy though? Like, it, but, but we immediately think in our minds as Americans, ah, oh, it's red sauce, you know? Well, but you know, not. that's an interesting thing because working for the Greeks, I, I realized very quickly that, the, that uh, Italian food is branding. They just branded the hell out of their olives. They branded the hell out of their tomatoes for the la- you know, for the, for the, uh, for the early modern era. That's, that's why we think that way about Italian sure. food is because the, Italians, the last hundred years, yeah, right? It's like, yeah. it's like the Greeks. I mean, and I'm not even just being uh, uh, a bragging Greek. 
but it's like the the olive oil is, is better when you get it from a Greek. And even and I've I've noticed a lot of like differences in in their wine and the wine culture in Greece in Greece is is very old and and but you don't think about it when you think when you think wine you think Italy when you think tomatoes you think Italy when you think olives to Italy so it's just a branding it's just a yeah it's ironic branded. too right because I think chronologically and I I can't you know I'm I'm not certain but you could probably make a distinction that it started in Greece and found its way into Rome much later right. Oh, yeah. Because when you think about the Roman sauces, and the Roman cooking technique, you know, we think of that as distinctly Italian. But the reality is, you know, it, it's the techniques are all d- distinctly Greek, right? From the winemaking to the olive oil, to the, you know. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's fascinating. You know, it's one thing you learn when you go to Spain is the apricots, almonds and honey all came from the Moroccan invasion. You know, the North African invasion. Yeah, the Moors. Moors invaded, uh, invaded Spain and basically indentured them to grow their farm products. Right. But today people think of Marcona almonds and, and the honey and the apricot dishes as being distinctly Italian, but the influence came from the Moorish invasion, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's really crazy stuff. I've been really enjoyed watching uh, Ugly Delicious with David Chang, because I like that he's on kind of this cultural search. And apparently, and I'm not a huge subscription service guy, so I don't really watch too much TV yeah. um, other than like YouTube and PBS. But uh, I guess Gordon Ramsay's doing a show where he goes around all these different parts of the world and finds like, you know, distinct cuisine and kind of distinct culture and, you know, then brings it into the modern context, you know, like how it's influenced. Um, so similar probably what David Chang is doing, I guess. I, yeah. yeah, for sure. And then there's, and then of course there's, and I don't know if we can say this on here or what the publication rules are, but there's also the chef's table, right? Where they have, yeah. they just literally go to different countries and then check out the Michelin star restaurant from that country. And it's like, you know, you have places with Peru where they're doing different dishes from different altitudes. I mean, the variety out show. there is, is, is intense. Yeah. It's crazy. I actually ate at Centro when I was in Lima. And we had that altitude menu. They've changed their concept now. They're doing something different now. But when I went, it was food from different altitudes. And we had, dude, we ate potatoes that I'd never seen before. You know, there's yeah. over like 200 native potatoes to Peru. And they featured them in probably a half a dozen of the 22 plates of food we got in wow. different forms. And it was super cool. I mean, it was really, it was an awesome experience. Wait. I really enjoyed Peru. It was really cool. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It was awesome. You know, and I love traveling. I mean, I think the secret to the success of any chef really is being able to travel and, and see that cultural experience, right? Like I'd I love to go to, to. To, to Greece and see it, you know, and, and even on, you know, even Turkey, like you're talking about Turkey earlier, but just, you know, those borders being next yeah. to each other. Think of the influence and in things like Mykonos Island and, and these yeah. different Mediterranean islands that have been occupied, you know, so many times over the course of, of our of human history. You know, the the entirety of the Mediterranean is a really interesting thing to think about because uh, if you go back far enough, that it's all of these cultures have ruled an empire that was that spanned the entirety of all of that at one point. And if it, it's like it's like things like baklava and hummus, it's like you don't even know which culture came up with it because it's always been in both these places. Well, not always, but from a certain p- period in time, it's been from, you know, both those places. So and certainly anybody would claim mad success now, right? Back to the branding point, right? You yeah. Know? Yep. If it becomes world famous, it was certainly invented, <laughs> you know, by everybody who made it, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly 100%. right. Yeah, yeah. I was just reading actually today uh, an article about um, uh, anthropologist who thinks that he's got traces of Native Americans going from South America into Polynesia that predates the Hawaiian immigration. So wow. he's claiming oh, wow. that perhaps the taro or some of the potatoes, the Okinawan soup, things like that, have found their way into the, you know, into the Polynesian islands and Micronesia um, because of early uh, Native American travelers from South America, just uh, specifically Chile and Peru. But hmm. wow, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah super cool. Super you know, cool. yeah, I'm a nerd, dude. You do as long as me. You read as much as you can, and you, you know try to i try always try to just you know i don't know it's all i read really is cookbooks isn't that terrible <laughs> no i think it's great i think it's great i've because, been collecting them because, for i don't know 30 some years i got so many i don't know what to do with it. well here's the thing everybody eats man and it's a basic everybody it's, a, eats. it's a basic human it's a basic human need and so yeah at, at, at it, you know it's the most important thing that i can think of it's like when everybody prays, you know, if you're, if you're a religious person, no matter what religion that you're going to, uh, you're praying about your food. 
right? Because absolutely, it's like it's just the it's a basic human necessity. So saying that you all all you read is cookbooks, it's like depending on what cookbook, you could be reading about anything, man. I do. I mean, look at you just told me about anthropology, and it was from a cookbook. I think it's just I think that's 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 why I got into this business is because yeah. that's what it is. It, it, humanness and, and, and cooking Family. are, are inseparable. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, what did Julia Child say? It, cooking is the life's most intimate proposition, right? I'm going to prepare something with my hands that you're going to put in your mouth. Right. I mean, yeah. and that, that's, I, that's always been one of my, in the back of my mind is that cook eating, right. Is, you know, it's, it's the old adage, you know, would you eat it? If you wouldn't eat it, you wouldn't serve it to somebody. You know? I, I'm hopeful though, back to your earlier reference on the call, culture of like Minnesota and other cuisines, you know, I hope that we get a richer culture of food in America. Like I think it's very diverse, like we're talking about everything, but the idea of, to me, you know, the importance of sharing a meal, sharing a table, sharing your food, uh, hospitality, service, charity, these are all things to me that are really, really important in food and the language of food, not unlike music, right? I almost, to your point, I don't think we think the humanities, you know, like the arts and music and these different humanities that we put food necessarily in that category. But to your point, I think you absolutely should, right? I mean, oh, I think the, meal, the meal you share when you go somewhere. I mean, I'd use Peru as my example when I was there with Catherine. And, and, you know, we went on a coffee expedition. So we were in the middle of the Amazonian mountains, you know, um, closer to the Ecuadorian border. And, dude, they didn't have anything. They were cooking on a clay stove with, like, two burner tops and wood and trying to feed 15 of us, you know, and they were, you know, I offered to help and they wouldn't let me cook, but they'd let me serve, you know, and carry food and, and, but they wouldn't let me do dishes or anything because it was a big deal for them to be able to provide for us, mm -hmm, you know, right. and it was really, to your point, very sacred for them to have that moment, you know, where they can actually, you know, they were like, we're so happy to have the Americans here and, you know, we've done this great food and all these things. And yeah. it was really cool. It was spiritual in a lot of respects, you know, because you're grateful when you're in the middle of a jungle, you know, for, two days for anything they eat other than the protein bar, you know? So yeah. that, that brings up a good point for me that, uh, uh, that I really want to ask you specifically. So where do you think that that, cause there, obviously there's a dichotomy between finding that spiritual essence of what cooking is and then dealing with American late capitalism and trying to make a restaurant and a business work, right? Because I saw you, yeah. I mean, it's like, I'd get to work and you had already been in meetings for four hours, right? And then you do your, and then you do your whole shift. And it's like, you're trying to make people who are, are, you know, you want them to spend enough money to make it worthwhile for all your employees to do all this work. And at the same time, you kind of want to, you, you still want to be rooted in that. Do you think that that is, that it's possible to do both those things at once? Or it, it, is that getting harder and harder to do? Well, I think I, scale is always important, right? We talk about modern era, right? Like how do you scale it up? I'll, I'll reference Seth in this one as bartending, you know, can you afford to make, handcrafted cocktails all night long with three bartenders in a 60 seat bar, you know, right. or, or if you're busy, do you have to batch cocktails? Are there, are there necessary shortcuts? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if you take those shortcuts, um, you know, are you compromising that vision? It's going to affect the product. product. Yeah. I, and I always say there's no shortcuts to the top. I truly believe you have to learn mm -hmm. to do it the, you know, the right way before you can streamline it or, you know, and you're never going to get the same result. Um, but the, another interesting part of that, I think, Christo, is you have to find what drives you. And for me, it's always been ingredient driven. I felt really fortunate to work at Goodfellows, you know, in 1989 when I did, because we were buying pork in the back door, venice in the back door. I mean, these chefs came to this town and for one year, you know, before they finished the development, all these guys did was source, source local ingredients. And at that time, there was no farm to table. It was just considered that the best way to get the best ingredients was buy the wild mushrooms from the forager, buy the venison mm -hmm. from a local farmer in Chisago right. City, buy, you know, and I learned that early on. And I honestly would say, hey, um, I became very ingredient driven and it's what I love today. Now, can you scale up that style, you know, to generate enough revenue? Um, I think it's why it becomes, and I hate to say this, it might sound pejorative, but it becomes kind of this elitist fine dining model that only a small percentage of people can afford. Because the reality is, you know, if you're going to feed a hundred people hand cut green beans every night, you know, from a farmer that you cleaned, washed and cut, you know, you got to right. charge a lot of money to make that labor happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the only people then that can really afford to eat that food, you know, are people with a greater income and greater availability, a smaller percentage. So a smaller and smaller percentage of people get to enjoy 
food at that level, right? Like I would say at some point I want to, I want to monetize my experience. Like you want to eat my food. There's a certain value to it for me because it comes from a lot of experience, right? right. But it doesn't always translate. And I think it's funny that if it's as important as we previously said, right, how important food is and sharing it, how little people value it in terms of their budget. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. do you go to the farmer's market and buy the pint of, of blueberries handpicked for $6? Or are you happy to buy off market ones from Peru and Chile for three ninety nine in the supermarket, you know, which is a deliberate, yeah. a deliberate ploy by big ag, right? They, they off market product in the stores when it's in season so they can, you know, hopefully drive you out of business. Right. So right. you have to determine that you value that food more than the commodity product. And I think it's a fine line for me to find my name in there and make it work is can you do that on a scale that you can generate enough revenue you yeah know? Mm -hmm. yeah and i think it was easier a decade ago than it is today the margins are much harder um, i think it's fair that people are getting paid more but i think it's gonna you know COVID is gonna lead us to a point where the only sustainable the only sustainability i see in the format unless you're you know charging 300 bucks for a sit down tasting menu is you're gonna have to do some kind of shared fee right it's gonna have to be a service fee yeah. or whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? It's going, to be a, it's going to be a service charge that equally divides the money amongst a team, which is really a European model, right? You go mm -hmm. to Europe, yeah. you, don't really, you don't really tip. You know, they, they have service fees in certain places, and that money gets disseminated to the staff equally, so it's actually a profession and a livable wage, you know? Yeah. And disproportionately right now, you know, for us, for us kitchen folks, you know, it's not always, unless you're, unless you're a salaried employee, it's likely not fair. And then if you're a salary, salaried employee, you're probably working 60 hours a week to make the same right. amount of revenue that or somebody, more. Yeah. yeah, is working, is working yeah. 28 hours or 32 hours, right? Yeah. Not even working a full 40 hour week and they're making as much as your, your most skilled employees in, in, the, in the kitchen. And that, you know, somehow that's got to change in order for the economics of making it change. I mean, it's going to be scary. You know, the Lex is open, you guys, and, and it's going as well as can be expected. I'm really proud of the team there. I personally haven't gone there being on treatment with cancer. Like, I, I fear the COVID, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think they've done a remarkable job. Now, you can't teach, you can't teach the painter to paint like the master. That's just the reality, right? Yeah, and, and I wouldn't expect that. They need to learn to paint their own way, you know, but, but with, again, going back to that technique and, and method-driven um, design. Uh, but, you know, I think it's not, are we open now and making it in the summertime and, and maybe early fall, but what does it look like in our, in our environment in January? Well, that's what I was just you know what ask. I mean? Like, and I think, think? That that's, that's the greater fear. I don't know. I've heard some experts say as much as 40% of restaurants won't reopen. Um, I subscribe to a lot of industry magazines. One of them, my wife gets is wine spectator. The issue just came yesterday for the month and Jose Andres on the cover saying, restaurants in America are in peril, you know, we're in crisis. I haven't read the article yet, but I'm curious kind of what he thinks. And I, I thought it really um, kind of ironic. Here's a guy who's, you know, literally bailed out a half a dozen disasters in the last two or three years, you know, even being considered nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize or was, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, here's a guy now who's in, in crisis mode and I'm sure thinking, what am I going to do now? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, somehow we got to figure it out. I don't know what it is. I was just reading that the only thing that's really increased in revenue in the second quarter is pizza. Yeah, and I just found out R Rose Street is turning into a pizza restaurant. Yeah, delivery, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and I think the restaurants that have been able, I'm digressing now, the restaurants that have been able to pivot and create an, an easy transition to takeout have done well. You know, yeah. I would use maybe Revival as an example. Um, you know, Pizzeria Lola, not to be redundant on the pizza. Right. Uh, you know, maybe maybe like, Foxy Falafel and St. Paul, like these things that are all kind of, yeah, sure, they've got seats inside, but it's certainly easy for them to turn that into a takeout model, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah totally and, those, and those restaurants, I think, will continue to do well because it's easily adapted to, to the format where, like what you and I were just talking about, you know, can you afford to have people hand making food every day and keeping it fresh and doing those things? You know, I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the economics guys. I hope I can. I'm, I'm hopeful. I pray every day cause it's my livelihood, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary stuff to think about, you know, cause it's like the, in my opinion, and I'm still a pretty young dude. So like a lot, a lot of it is just from what I read and from what other people tell me, but I, I feel like that the margins were already so thin that the restaurant industry was, was in a crisis before COVID happened. Whoa. 
one hundred percent. It yeah. was. You know, if you're probably working at Broders, you know, I mean, I'm sure the wine bar, you know, struggles to be busy consistently. You know, I'm sure there's nights when it is busy, but there's nights when they wonder what they're doing, right? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, and again, it goes back to that dichotomy of like, where where are we willing to cut corners so that we can stay operational? And that's a place. And, and that's a sorry, place that's been around for for you know almost 50 years. A long time. And a great place with a great reputation. And Molly's yeah. awesome. And so are kids, Charlie. And, and I think, you know, the other, the other interesting part to me, you guys, is, um, you know, there's a lot of seats. You know, there's a lot of people with restaurants in the Twin Cities. And as, as you begin to watch the nation become employed, and I think that that is even a bigger question is how long, you know, how long can restaurants endure, but how many people are actually going to get their job back, right? Yeah. Right. And how many, how many commercial, how many commercial buildings, and businesses within them are going to realize shit if 50 percent of my staff can work from home and i'm successful why would i ever pay the lease on a commercial property right yeah you know and i think it's going to force the hand of things in my mind like automation ai all these things they can do to take away the human element you know to to fast track things and, and make it easier is absolutely going to happen and i think COVID is just going to COVID is just going to accelerate that to your point of being in crisis already um so I think COVID is just going to accelerate that crisis and people are going to have, you know, people will adapt. Right. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean that's just, that's the way of us. Yeah. You know? It's just a scary thing to see that it is because a lot of well, all three of us sitting here right now have made our, have made our livings doing that work. And mm -hmm. the fear is, you know, what's the value of that work and does that work still exist? I mean, if, if we got 60 million unemployed, you know, and, and 30 million of them don't go back to work in the next six months, what does our economy look like? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of people, you guys. So a lot you know? of people. A lot of people. It's a lot of. And people. so it is scary. And I and I don't. Again, I don't have the answers. You know, and I really I don't think until you can have. You know, I'll be political for a minute. I, I don't think until you can have adequate testing, however we achieve that, and you have an actual um, vaccine, which not only is producing it going to be, you know, a time-consuming process, and who knows what happened, but then implementing it. Right. It's one yeah. thing to create it. It's another thing to get it to. 60 million people or yeah, by that time maybe 120 million people worldwide and distribute it how do you do that right i mean talk about scaling up dude it's going to be fascinating to watch it happen you know hmm. i'm hopeful yeah you know and i think when you look at protests and equality and everything you're you know you're seeing you're seeing a crisis that exposed the weaknesses within our communities you For know sure. And including restaurants, right? And and so many of these restaurants that we're talking about, you guys, these these restaurants that you know that are are immigrant owned, people of color owned. These are important parts of their community, not unlike what I do either, right? I mean, these become inter, you know, Lex is an integral part of a community that's been there for years and years. So are these smaller restaurants that exist in neighborhoods and other places, and and they're in jeopardy, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they are. So it's uh, it's interesting. Fascinating times, you guys. I mean, it's the new, I like to say it's the new, it's the new abnormal, right? I mean, because it, because I think some things that we see aren't going away. The plexiglass, the plexiglass at the grocery store and the pharmacy aren't going away. No, you know yeah, what I mean, no, for sure, they'll be there forever, you know. And for sure, and that's why I say, it, you know, I mean, think of all the commercial businesses sitting empty in downtown, you know, in urban areas throughout our country right now. Not just to mention the Twin Cities, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do those people go back to work? You know. Well, we'll see so, how it goes, man. We'll see how it goes because there's just so there's so much that's still up in the air. You know what I mean? And like you said earlier, it, 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 feeding people is important, dude. There'll always be a place for it. You know? Yeah. Well, and it's just what it looks like. One big thing for me, and I, I think this is going to be like a recurring theme on on this show because I'm I just kind of like I'm always on my soapbox about this. But the regardless of what the restaurants do, and regardless of what uh, what people are eating at their table, it starts with agriculture, right? And the and the agriculture and the and the way that we uh, we raise our animals in the in the United States has just gotten uh, it's gotten ugly. You know what I mean? I'm, so like yeah. so like if you look at a, at it from a more holistic point of view, um, you know, it's like I I'm talking about change that needs to happen is things like what Dan Barber is doing with Blue Hill at Stone Barns, where he's going, you know, it's like this and the entirety of this, of what I, I do, the supply chain is owned by me and everything is done, you know, with, with minimal chemicals, min minimal antibiotics, uh, you know, mi uh, and everything is, is, is holistic. Everything works together. You know what I mean? And I think that that is a change that, so he talks about it being more of like the chefs drive what, is needed by 
uh, by changing what people eat. So if you, if you want something that's higher quality or if you want something, you know, cause it's like when I taste beef that is, that is taken care of properly, that isn't, you know, shot through shot full of all these different antibiotics, it's, it, it's night and day to what I'm used to a, a, a steer raised in a CAFO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what he talks about is how chefs drive that community. And then the agriculture needs to be in the back to support that change and that change in culture. Yeah, I think it, I think, you know, there's a couple of really difficult things in there. We talked earlier when we talked about, you know, who's going to be able to afford eating at that level, right? Because the scale, how, how does Dan Barber scale that up? And the example I would use is, it's kind of like we just had the egg scare, you know what, a dec not even a decade ago now, I guess, a decade ago, had the huge egg, egg scare in Minnesota, right? And I guess let me, let me start out by saying, I think one thing that's happened during COVID and, and to what you're talking about at, at facilitating change is it's exposed the vulnerability of our food supply, right? Yeah. And, and we realize today that, you know, that agriculture and that supply is really important, right? When three, when three meat processing plants shut down in the country, and it becomes a shortage, that's a problem, right? Like, yeah, are, we, are we that dependent on just three facilities? You know, like, right. where is that supply chain? Like you're saying, and is it vertically integrated, right? So to your point of vertical integration, do you control everything? I mean, Costco, I'm digressing again, Costco is just building a giant, like $52 million farm in Nebraska because they want to raise all their own chickens for rotisserie because they can't compete in the market and keep the price at the level that they want. So right. they're just going to do mm -hmm. it themselves and control it. Now, are they going to use good animal husbandry and other practices good? I don't know that, you know. But I think to the point I was going to make with the egg scare is that we all want to eat grandma's eggs from a chicken. But the reality is when you're trying to feed, you know, 120 million Americans eggs every day, it can't all come from grandma's farm. You know what I mean? I mean, there's right. a part of industrial farming that's a necessity to feed a country of people at the level that we are. But I think the greater question I think you're asking, Christo, is – is can we achieve both? You know, can we have good animal husbandry? Can we have good care of the land? Can big ag really provide us a quality product and distribute it? And and we're not at we're not at the um, oh, did I lose you guys? Well, we have your audio. We don't have your visual. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I just got a call. Um, no, what I was gonna say is, can we afford to do that? I guess you know, I always think to myself, and, and this is just an easy way to describe what I call the food void in our country for healthy food is why does a pound of organic broccoli mm -hmm. cost the same or more money as a pound of ground beef, yeah. even on a commodity level of ground beef, right? Like why mm -hmm. in the hell is broccoli $2 a pound and ground right. beef's a buck 79? Like explain that to me, right? Like, and now you're seeing in COVID with the meat packing, you know, ground beef and a lot of the, uh, the meat products have gone through the roof in terms of pricing because it's a limited supply now, right? They can do that. But I just think it's it's ironic to me that something that's easy to grow, there's likely two broccoli crops in California a year, you know, why is that cost more money? You can't, no one can tell me that 18 months to raise a steer, process it, grind it, package it, and ship it should ever cost Cheaper. more. And, well, well, we subsidize it all, right? Because we want to feed our country protein and we want to, we want to make it happen. There's a really, I wish I could remember well, the we, woman's uh, name there. I, I'm, I'm going to stop you and say that we, we subsidize it a lot because of our, our ideals around corn and what we've done with corn. Oh, and, 100%. All and, of it. Yeah. Totally. And, and I think that really the answer, and obviously this is just like, you know, this is me getting on my soapbox box, but the, the answer is the, is decentralization because once you have, once you have complete vertical integration on the, on the level of, of what you, what you would call big egg, right? Then, then big egg is in control and, and all that big egg is, is, uh, is actually made to do. It's designed to do is make money and not feed the economy. So you're, sure. you're, you're reliant on a, on something that, that isn't even designed to do what you need it to do. Now, when you talk about Dan Barber, it's interesting. I've been a proponent of farm raised fish probably since the early 90s and as you guys know i mean i'm a hawaii junkie anytime i go to the pacific ocean anywhere i go because i love the pacific but i've literally watched in my life a cutting fish and fish availability it, the the change is astronomical i mean in 1989 i would cut swordfish loins that were you know 10 inches or 12 inches in diameter right yeah and today you get them when they're four or five inches you know right. and we're talking about you know 20 years roughly 
mm -hmm. right? Maybe, maybe 25 years, that dramatic of change, you know? And I think it's interesting when you talk about animal husbandry, there's a lot of cons to fish farming at least in its inception that are beginning to get better and better because it's like anything, you know, you're talking about big ag right now. If you look at, if you look at agriculture at the turn of the, of the 20th century, dude, it was as horrible as fish farming. Dude, we were using DDT and these horrible chemicals and Roundup, we weren't taking care of topsoil, we weren't doing things. And, you know, so yeah, so fish farming its inception probably wasn't going to be to the level it is, but if you don't demand it, and if we don't, as chefs, to your point, Dan Barber, support good products and products that are actually done with good intent and, and honest farming, you're never going to achieve what you're talking about. You know, and so as a chef, you know, part of the dilemma for me is, again, how do you scale up using the best possible ingredients? So we use all Revere beef when I worked at Dakota. Now, I'm not going to say that they're, that they're not a feedlot. He's a, he's a giant cooperative farmer, but he has high standards. He does very sustainable things. He traps all his methane and runs his all of his farming equipment heats his farms on methane gas that he converts from manure gas. I mean, he does a lot of really progressive things. And is it, is it the best? No, but it's absolutely a step in the right direction, particularly when you're trying to run a meat house, right? Like you got to come up with some way between being able to provide enough. And the example I use is butchering the boar is the perfect example. I fought and fought and fought to find the right farmers for the right beef because I really wanted grass fed because grass fed smoked beef to me tastes the best. The texture isn't always great, but I found a guy named Ryan Jepson, a farmer from Spring Grove, Minnesota, who owned Grass Run Farms. I don't know if you ever heard of Grass Run Farms. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he was doing the awesome beef, similar to what Revere's doing now. Um, and I opened up and I was using that for the long run and everybody couldn't believe how good it was. But by the time I was open three months and my revenue was pushing, you know, $7 million annually, that guy couldn't create enough of the product for me. And I didn't have a choice but to go to the commodity market mm -hmm. or I wouldn't have been able to even produce the product. You know, right. and that's my point of scaling up, right? When, when you're trying to feed thousands of people a day, that beef short rib, you know, you can't, it can't come from a single grass fed cow. It just can't, you know? Right. So the bigger question is how do we culturally change? I think you touched on this, Christo, like with promoting corn and our relationship with corn in this country, you know, unless we demand that to change and we demand it with our pocketbooks and we look at, you know, I love, I love beef, you know that, but I probably only eat beef once or twice a month and I don't yeah. eat any ground meat. Do you know what I mean? Right. And so it becomes a treat, right? And the sad thing is the sustainable things that we should eat, like lamb and goat, dude, Americans eat less of that than the whole world. You yeah. know, like mm -hmm. I don't even think, I don't even think lamb is, you know, maybe now with the influx of more of, of, uh, of the uh, Middle Eastern culture into our country and or the, you know, with immigration, um, dare I call it the Muslim immigration, I don't want people to panic. Um, <laughs> I think there's more of a demand for that halal goat and lamb. 100%. And quite frankly, when I want lamb now, dude, I go buy it from the halal market, dude. The yeah. shit's delicious, right? Oh, yeah. And I think until we look at that as, you know, that's the most sustainable red meat on the planet, yet Americans, I don't think 10% of Americans eat lamb. But you mm -hmm. look at the rest of the world, it's like 80%. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Like everybody eats it. And so why is it our relationship to corn and beef is so great? It's, you know, it's, it's a bit empirical, I guess I would say. It's, you well, know, it's the a, idea that I've arrived, right? I bought the big piece of beef and, you know, and the rest of the world kind of, afford to raise beef like us dude they don't have the land they don't have the feed you know i mean yeah. we're pretty we're pretty lucky well and it's a house of cards it really is a house of cards that's what that i mean not not with beef but that's what happened with greece that's what happened with rome that's what that's what's happening in syria is is that over uh, over over use of their land uh over plowing not caring for their topsoil and the civilization eventually crumbled now yeah, what, one down thing, the rainforest, one, dude. one thing yeah, that terrible. i want to say is that it's the I think that it's partly a chef's responsibility and Dan Barber touches on this. It's partly a chef's responsibility to help form that culture around food. So the people who are, who are, you know, who are not necessarily doing the, the super high volume, but the people who have like people know who you are, people who know, people know who Gavin are and people uh, you know, people in this community, they, they look to that to build their, to build their palate around. Right. So you bring that food and you drive the culture. At least that's what Dan Barber says. And I, on, I honestly agree with that is that the culture around food starts with the chefs. Hey, everybody. I want to give a quick shout out to Advanced Auto Works uh, in Little Canada. They are our first sponsor and they've helped us get everything uh, set up and off the ground. 
they do great work uh, out in the Little Canada, Maplewood, Oakdale area. Um, they do all the dealerships out there, and uh, they they've done detailing for me. And uh, mine was just you know the basic stuff, clean up and and a little bit of a buff. Uh, however, they do wet sand buffing, paint touch ups, ceramic coating. Uh, actually, a lot more than that. But for this ad, I want to I want to keep those three things are, are things they do better than anybody else in the area. Uh, their address is 3171 Spruce Street, Little Canada, Minnesota, 55117. And you can reach them at 612-636-5537. Tell them Minnesota Well Done sent you. Thanks, guys. Um, you know, again, it's, you know, it's, it's all scale. And I think it's important, like you say, that chefs that know better should use the platform. I mean, it's, it's important. And I think you know, I, I've always used the term sustainability. I prefer that over trying to teach people organic diet and how important it is. Because the reality is, no matter what you're using, organic or conventional, if you're not good stewards, none of it really matters, right? right. 100%. I mean, the idea is that whatever we do today, we leave something for the next generation. And, and I think for me, a big part of me being a chef today with my experience is that I hope to educate the next generation of people coming through the kitchen, you know? Yeah. And I hope that chefs can use their voice to your point to, to help that happen. Right. The importance, I mean, think how disconnected we are as a culture from our food compared to so much of the world, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. How many people have even been on an active farm? How many people have been in a containment barn for pork? How many people have been in a, in yeah. a Turkey bin? I mean, I, I don't know, you know, yeah. I'm lucky. I've seen yeah. I've plucked chickens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, too, I mean, I, I'm a huge component in terms of respect to Christoph. You know, cutting all your meat and producing all your own burger and doing all that. I and mean, we do all that in house at, at the Lex. And I think that, you know, to me, there's a certain importance of people learning that, you know. Yeah. I think there's oh, a huge importance. Well, think, we tried to do, though, integral. manufacture. I mean, late stage capitalism, you know, there's a lot of arguments for that. Um, but I think, you know, there's a race to the bottom in terms of skilled labor. And you see in the effect of it, right? Yep. So, suddenly what's essential is taking on a whole new meaning like we talked about in COVID, right? You know, shit, man, do we have enough meat cutters? Do we have enough farmers? Do we have enough people working in grocery stores that can actually get food to the front lines when it's needed? You know, and I, I think we've put, we put it to the test and I think you're right to say, Christo, you know, it's, it's an important time. And you guys are much younger than me, but I recently, in the last year, I guess a little more than a year, I went on a bachelor trip with a bunch of you know, highly educated guys. There was food scientists there. There was a lot of people with master's degrees, a couple of PhDs, and they were all in their mid thirties. I was the oldest by at least 15 years, I'd say maybe 20. Um, most were married, most had kids and the, the level of their conversation revolving around food security and, and, and water purity, these things was really refreshing for me to see, right? Because yeah. I'm watching a generation come behind me where you know, the most important thing to them is, is food security and fresh water, you know? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was very, very encouraging for me, you know, to see people that actually are worried about it, you know, cause yeah. it's a reality. Yeah. yeah We're going to see it in our lifetime, particularly with, particularly with climate change, dude. I mean, climate change isn't a joke either. That's part of, that's part of what's affecting the wild fish in the ocean and the things that we're talking about. Yeah. But, you know, it's well, it's it gotta be a collective. Even you know, here in well, Minnesota, the climate change. Um, yeah. We've oh, seen dude, dramatically change in in the last couple of years here. Um, dude, there's cicada bugs in June. Dude, you never heard those till August when I was a kid. You know yeah, mean? crazy. Yeah, and it all feeds into each other. I mean, you start you start with climate change, then that adds to desertification. Desertification adds to climate change. Climate change adds to acidification. Acidification adds to climate change, which adds to it's just like it's a yeah, we're like in a said, we're dude, in a crazy like, spiral right now. It's it's, it's, it's Pandora's but yeah, and we're we're succumbing to pandemics and all these things. I mean, it's um. I, I'm hopeful, though. I'm hopeful that guys like you doing these podcasts and people that want to bring social awareness and social commentary to things I think that are really, really important. They're questions that have to be asked, you know, um, because I think if we don't address it, I mean, we should have addressed it a long time ago, but if we don't address it now, you know, what's it look like? There's going to be, you know, we think there's a food desert now, dude. Look at 2050, you know, that's yeah. all of our lifetimes. Right. It could be dire. Well, yeah, Jack, we're we're over an hour here, and and we don't want to. Oh go, yeah, I was gonna say I gotta let you guys much. go. I'm gonna cook. Oh, awesome! Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity. This is really fun. Yeah, yeah thank we you loved, very much, food. Jack. We loved having you on, and we'd love to have you on again in the future. Yeah, cheers. Give me a topic. I'd love to talk to you about it. You got Sweet. it. Thank you. Peace, guys. Aloha, brother. Yeah, thank you.
Hey, everybody. I hope that you really enjoyed that episode with Jack Rebel. Uh, I know I enjoyed the conversation. I think there was a lot of good stuff that we had in there, and there's still so much to talk uh, to him about, and we plan on doing that in the future. Um, We have Kevin Roos coming up in the next couple weeks, and next week uh, Seth and I are going to be doing an episode uh, with just us hopefully going over some of the history of, uh, of Minnesota food cultures in little spots in, in different parts of the, uh, of the metro area. Uh, I want to remind, remind everybody that we do have a Patreon set up. Uh, you go to www.patreon.com slash Minnesota Well Done, and we have t- three tiers set up. Uh, the $5 tier, which is just $5 monthly support. Uh, for Minnesota Well Done. If you like what we're doing, you want to see more, uh, you just uh, sign up for that $5 mem- membership. At the $10 membership, you can get um, more more episodes, um, p- uh, point of view cooking. Um, we're going to be going over some of the recipes that we talk about on the show uh, and, and doing a very hands-on, you know, le- a lesson-style approach with like a GoPro. Uh, it's, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be really fun. Uh, and then at the $20 level, uh, it's, uh, you get a little bit more out of it. You do get those special episodes, the, the point of view cooking, but you also get a three ring binder and every month we're going to send you recipes from different cooks in the area. So, you know, if we have a cook on this show, we're going to get their, one of their special recipes that they don't necessarily use anymore or don't sell anymore. And we're going to put it in the book. Um, we're going to start off with Seth. Uh, Seth's recipe of, uh, for his gnocchi, and then uh, we're going to move on to my arancini recipe, and then we're going to go from there. Um, also, uh, you get a free mug. Mugs come in on the 20th, so uh, y- you'll get a free Minnesota Well Done mug. And then uh, also, um, y- you get a call out on the show. So our first $20 men- uh, member is Terry Williams. Um, He's actually an old friend of mine and he's doing great things. He started his own company. He's doing pop-ups all over all over the city You should check him out on Facebook if you can Um, And yeah, I mean that that's that's pretty much it But that patreon is gonna be super important for us. It's gonna keep us uh, Able to do the show the the way that we want to do we're not gonna have to censor ourselves um, And it will it'll just help us along the road to to get better and better for everybody at home uh Again, I want to thank everybody for making this possible because uh, it's it's become a really fun, exciting thing for me to do. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week.